Welcome to the latest episode of British History, Royals, Rebels, and Romantics, the podcast for people who understand that history shows us what's possible for us in our lives today. I'm Carol Ann Lloyd, your host and tour guide as we travel back in time. We're shaking up history to look at the stories that don't always make the history books, to consider famous and infamous characters in new and interesting ways, and to look for all the things that we share even when we're living in different times and places. I hope you enjoy this journey through the royals, rebels, and romantics of Britain. Now, let's explore history together. Today, we're looking at the history of underwear. The first question you might ask is, why? Why spend time thinking about something so mundane, so personal, so domestic? Because something so personal and utilitarian can give us a real glimpse into the way people lived their most personal lives hundreds of years ago. So let's take a look at what's happening under all those glamorous clothes. We'll start with a surprise. Women of the Middle Ages layered, starting with a long smock worn next to the skin and heavier dresses on top. It was thought that was about it until a discovery in Austria unearthed some unexpected medieval undies. Lenberg Castle is first mentioned in 1190. It was rebuilt in the 15th century and a modern second floor was added. In 2008, during extensive reconstruction, workers discovered a vault under the floorboards. Inside, researchers found leather shoes and textiles, including four medieval bras with shoulder straps. This was an astonishing discovery, as historians had previously believed that the bra was a 20th century invention. Apparently, we didn't know as much as we thought about people's unmentionables. So let's take a closer look at underwear in medieval, Tudor, and Victorian times. Medieval. We don't have much information about clothing in the Middle Ages, and what we have doesn't talk much about underwear. We have some images in artwork, but it's limited. And since undergarments were typically made of linen, they seldom survived for more than a few years. That's one of the things that makes the Lemberg Castle find so amazing. The first layer worn by men and women during this time was typically the chemise, or under tunic. These garments were lightweight and often had long sleeves. They went past the waist for men and usually as far as the ankles for women. They were loose and billowy. The chemise was made of linen or hemp cloth. Wealthy and nobility wore items made of silk. In addition to providing warmth and protection for the wearer, the chemise protected clothing. The expensive fabrics worn by nobles and wealthy members of court were almost impossible to clean. Covering the the body with a washable linen chemise was one way of preserving the more expensive outer garments against sweat and just wearing out. Medieval men and women brought the idea of the Roman loincloth practice to England. In Imperial Rome, men and women generally wore what was comfortable, available, or necessary for modesty and protection. This meant simply wrapped cloth coverings, likely made from linen, under their outer garments. This would be the essence of the loincloth. Protect and cover what you need to. But in colder climates, more was necessary. Medieval men wore a baggy type of underpants made of linen and known as braise, breeze, breeks, or breeches. The braise were different lengths from mid-thigh to below the knee. They could be closed at the waist with a drawstring. Some were held up by a separate belt. Men frequently tucked the chemise into their braise. Weather, need for mobility, ease getting on and off, and minimal maintenance made this type of undergarment popular. Along with their braids, men wore long-fitted socks that came up to their hips. We sometimes think of these as tights, but the two sides were not connected at this time. So each leg would be tied to the braids or a separate belt to keep them up. There are images of these in medieval artwork with men working in the fields or fishing and wearing braids. Other images showing men's underwear are found in, of all places, medieval Bibles. 
Women's clothing is less well-known once we get beneath the top layer. There are almost no references to women's undergarments. Women are not depicted working in the fields wearing anything other than the garments similar to those they wore everywhere else. Women wore long shifts next to their skin and layered long gowns over these. Did they wear anything else underneath? We don't know. If you think comfort and practicality, there might have been some kind of loincloth or short braise, but there's no evidence of that. At least not yet. Who knows what might be found one day? The Tudors. A must-have item for men in the 15th and 16th century. Starting in the 15th century, men's typical dress consisted of doublet and hose. As the doublets or tunics began to grow shorter and the length of mantles decreased, the chemise was not long enough to cover everything. Something else was needed. In fact, Edward IV's Parliament made it compulsory for a man to cover his, quote, privy members. This led to the early codpiece, a form of gusset attached to the doublet. When Henry VIII came to the throne in 1509, the royal wardrobe and accompanying underwear pieces were about to get a big change. Doublets got shorter because Henry wanted to show off. First, he wanted to show off his calves and his legs. Henry loved to wear stockings and is even seen sporting some bright red stockings in the famous bar barber surgeon's portrait. Then he wanted to show off something else. In Henry's reign, masculinity was on the line as the years ticked by without a son. Masculinity was at the core of power and politics throughout 16th century Europe. The idea of chivalry and romance and honor were bound up with the codpiece as the underwear of earlier years became one of the most prominent parts of the male wardrobe. In Henry VIII's reign, the codpiece reached epic proportions. They were made of luxury silk velvet and often bejeweled and embroidered. During the reign of the two Tudor queens, the codpiece fell from favor through the end of the century. The focus shifted to the peace cod type of doublet, and the codpiece was reduced. Often hidden by billowing britches, the codpiece of the late 16th and early 17th century retreated and became more like underwear once more. Considering the second half of the 16th century was ruled by the Virgin Queen, that seems appropriate. Women and shapeshifters. Beginning in the 15th century, women's underwear began to literally change their appearance and shape, especially the bottom half. The farthingale is one of several structures worn under a woman's skirt in the 16th and 17th century to enlarge the lower half of the body. It originated in Spain in the 15th century. When Catherine of Aragon traveled to England in 1501, she brought the style to the English court. It took several years to catch on and appear in portraits and documents. The farthingale is evident with English royal women by the 1540s. Portraits of Princess Elizabeth and Catherine Parr clearly show they are wearing farthingales. This style allowed royal women to demonstrate their wealth and influence. The layers of fine fabric over the farthingale were available only to the wealthy. The ability to display an elegant kirtle under the gown was possible because of the structured undergarment. Farthingales were shaped with esperado grass, willow withies, rope, and finally whalebone, which is the hair or bristles inside the whale's mouth that can be stiffened and used to shape various garments. Sometimes royals and other very wealthy women would have specially made farthingales that were so elegant and decorated themselves that they were worn to be seen. According to records, Queen Mary I had a farthingale of crimson satin edged with velvet. Underwear as outerwear. How royal. In the 1580s, the French farthingale began to gain popularity. Queen Elizabeth is seeing both French and seen wearing both French and Spanish farthingales. In the late eight, 1580s, Elizabeth is often seen wearing the French or drum farthingale. Sometimes this style is referred to as a wheel because it seems the woman is standing in the middle of a wheel. In this style, the woman wears a thickly stuffed hip roll or bum roll over the farthingale, which is also very stiff and designed to go out at nearly a right angle from her body. Then layers of expensive fabric are piled on top. 
This shape creates an opportunity for the queen or other very wealthy and high status women to wear and show off yards and yards of rich fabric. The Ditchley portrait of Queen Elizabeth I is a great example of the French farthingale. Victorians. After the Georgians, the plan was to have Princess Charlotte inherit the throne. She stepped away from the excesses of the Georgian wardrobe, opting for a slimmed-down look that reflected the natural shape of the female body. However, Charlotte's early death prevented her from taking the throne. Instead, George IV was followed by William IV, and then by a woman who would rule for the rest of the century, Queen Victoria. The invention of the sewing machine in the early decades of Victoria's reign led to the mass production of clothing and underwear. Some items were still stitched by hand, but the sewing machine meant that manufacturers could produce numerous pieces in different designs. Victorian women still wore a chemise against the skin. This was a shapeless and long skirt that had a drawstring around the neck. It was made, again, of linen or cotton. Men also wore a chemise and long drawers made of cotton or linen. Wealthier men and women, again, garments made of silk. Sometimes in especially cold weather, they wore undervests of merino wool or flannel. And by the 1870s, some wore union suits, a combination of top and bottom undergarments. Men's additional underwear or supporting garments included braces or suspenders to hold up the drawers and trousers, and sometimes a corset to maintain a tapered waist. That was about it. Women's additional underwear was much more extensive. Let's start with corsets. Corsets didn't start with the Victorians, but the age took it to new heights. In the 1840s, corsets were cut from separate pieces and stitched together to give roundness to the bust, to pull in the waist, and to shape the thighs. A broad busk was inserted in the center to give a smooth line to the bodice. Strips of whalebone were inserted to give more structure and conceal the chemise, drawers, and petticoats underneath. One of the outcomes of the corset was a stiff posture the woman had to maintain. The fashion style set by the queen included that posture with drooping shoulders and low waists, all of which was enabled by the corset. Skirts got wider as the century went on. Many petticoats were worn at the same time to create the bell-shaped skirt. The numerous petticoats were starched or had horsehair to stiffen them in the back. The crinoline face began with a bustle. This was made of stuffed horsehair and extended the rear of the dress. There are examples of these at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. In the, 15, in the 1850s and 60s, cage crinolines became popular, sometimes called cage petticoats. These wide undergarments used whalebone and, more often, steel hoops to hold the dresses out to a stunning width. Daytime cage petticoats could include nine steel hoops, and for evening, you might get as many as 18. The crinolines did have a downside. There are wild stories of the crinolines being so big that women were bumping into candles, catching on fire, and burning to death in their dresses. There are also stories of the garment being cut up in, by a moving carriage or cart and a woman being dragged down the street. But these were the exception. The positive thing about this cage petticoat was fewer petticoats and room to move. Queen Victoria was concerned about projecting messages through her wardrobe at the beginning of her reign. She specifically cultivated her role as queen, wife, and mother by rejecting some of the excesses of her predecessors. As she moved into her role as widow, she isolated herself from many of the fashion changes of her nation. Decorative petticoats were becoming popular in the 1860s just as Victoria was going into mourning. Victoria's lack of height was emphasized by the sizes of her skirts, and she maintained this throughout the rest of her reign. When the crinoline collapsed and petticoats became narrower, Victoria remained in her big black dress. When petticoats with cascades of flounces down the back were worn in the 1870s or bustles returned in the 1880s, the queen remained in her big black dress. Only for her golden jubilee in 1887 did the queen allow her ladies-in-waiting to wear something other than full mourning. She finally began to allow some white lace and gray satin touches to her own clothing. And she added white lace and flowers to her bonnet. 
but her big skirts, held up by all those royal petticoats, remained. Throughout history, people responded to changes in climate and technology, to wars and regimes being overthrown, to hunger, to marriage and birth and death in public ways. They also responded in private ways. And private choices are sometimes represented by these most private moments and bits of clothing. Looking at the private moments can help us understand who those people really were. And understanding them helps us understand where we come from, who we are, and who we can be. Thank you for joining us to take a sneak peek into the history of underwear. Next week, come back as we wrap up our look at the royal wardrobe with the crowning glory, the jewels. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please share with a friend. Do send any questions or comments. I'd love to hear from you where we should explore next. And please subscribe and leave a review. I'd really appreciate it. I'm so glad we could explore history together. Till next time. Thank you.